Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Hui Kai, Head of Wuxi Apta Content Division. On behalf of my colleagues around the world, welcome to today's virtual event, Emerging Opportunities in MS and Neuroscience. We thank you for joining us today as we bring together diverse perspectives on this difficult disease. Today's program is the fourth episode of Wuxi Apta ongoing webinar series, Collaborations That Transform. We hope through this series to tell the stories of innovation and collaboration that transcend industries and geographies as we work together to yield breakthroughs for some of the today's most challenging diseases. We also hope to use this opportunity for us all to think through new and creative ideas to advance medical and uh, scientific innovation in support of patients worldwide. MS is a disease that is impacting more than 2.5 million individuals globally and is the leading cause of the lung traumatic disability for young adults. Despite over the past 20 years of great progress in MS research, the underlying cause of MS has not been fully understood creating challenges in its diagnosis and treatment. Today, we'll have three tracks to discuss all these issues. We'll begin with a, take a broader look at neuroscience R&D and see how knowledge in one field can translate into different disease and different disciplines. Then we'll take a deeper dive into the clinical and patient perspectives. And finally, we'll close with a take closer look at the drug development process how the current future pipeline may look like. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our first panel, Dietmar Berger, Global Head of Development and Chief Medical Officer at Sanofi, and Kevin DeSover, Chief Editor of Nature Neuroscience. Hi everyone, my name is Kevin DeSover and I'm the Chief Editor of the journal Nature Neuroscience. It's my pleasure to introduce Dietmar Berger, Chief Medical Officer and Head of Global Development at Sanofi. Our discussion today will focus on drug development in multiple sclerosis and examine about how what we've learned in MS can be translated to other areas of neuroscience. Dietmar, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by looking a bit at what makes uh, MS unique. Uh, there's been some difficulty in developing new therapies in some areas of neuroscience, particularly neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, but MS stands out as one of those areas where there have been several drugs targeting distinct mechanisms approved. So what distinguishes MS from other indications? Yeah, you know, the, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to discuss uh, MS and neuroscience. I believe success in MS has been driven largely by scientific insight. While we don't know the exact trigger of MS at this point, we've learned a lot early on about mechanisms of disease, and we know that immunology plays a key role. And we have established mechanisms to suppress and impact immunological reactions. So we had these early successes, for example, with interferons, with uh, glatiramer, and that success has fueled the development of more and more effective therapies. In addition, there's a clear unmet medical need and, and a high level of motivation. MS affects relatively young people. It may lead to severe disability, and individuals and society may get substantial benefit over time from disease-modifying treatments. Mm -hmm. And as a third factor, we had mechanisms to study also clinically uh, the course of MS. MRI has turned out to be a highly predictive, you know, early and quantifiable endpoint. And that has been critical for early no-go decisions in development. So I want to pick up on what you said about biology and mechanisms. So our knowledge of the pathogenesis of MS has been gleaned in part from clinical models like EAE, which has its limitations, but certainly has its benefits as well. Uh, cellular models and genetic studies in like large populations to identify these targets. So from your perspective, how important is this understanding of basic biology and the availability of these different model systems in drug development, particularly in this area? The understanding of disease biology is critical for, for drug development and, and critical in, in neuroscience to, to build confidence in those drug targets and, and then enable approaches like targeted therapies. Um, with regards to models, there, there are many variants of the EAE models and, and also other MS models, and each of them have different characteristics. For example, when it comes to T cell dependence, B cell dependence, uh, and other characteristics. And uh, we have to make sure that those models are selected based on the questions that, that are at hand, on the questions being asked. 
Um, so yes, the models have been very important for development of, of MS therapies. Um, even though some of them do not predict uh, directly the outcomes in patients, and that's then also where the diagnostic tools come in. Right. So picking up on, again on the, on the mechanisms, because you mentioned that you know inflammatory mechanisms are very commonly observed. So it's clear that MS is both inflammatory and has an neurodegenerative component, and these feed each other. Whether one comes from the before the other is uh, an open debate. So these changes occur both in the periphery and in the CNS, both in terms of immune activation in the periphery and then damage in the CNS. So based on this understanding of both an inflammatory and neurodegenerative component, as well as peripheral and central mechanisms, um, can you discuss how our understanding of the interplay between cells like neurons, glia, and immune cells, be adaptive or innate, uh, are informing what cells to target and where? Yeah, that, that interplay, I think, is, is really important and will become more important as, as our understanding deepers, uh, deepens. I think this, this combination of pathology, imaging, genetics, expression profiling, and other types of omics technologies um, will help us to determine further which cells and, and, and pathways to target in MS. So what we know now is T and B cell interactions in the periphery and trafficking to the CNS appear important for the focal, more inflammatory part of the disease. And then microglia appears to be an important cell type in the CNS, um, supported by genetics and expression profiling and, and imaging pathology. And activated or, or dysregulated microglia may be a relevant target for the important longer term so-called smoldering inflammation that's then linked to the degenerative component of, of, of the disease. At this stage, I believe we have good approaches to treat the earlier inflammatory stages, uh, for example, targeting B cells, but we're just starting to address the smoldering inflammation in the CNS microenvironment, which then seem to be, seems to be relevant, uh, you know, especially in the progressive forms of the disease. Right. So you talked about this kind of evolution of the disease and progression. So looking at the clinical presentation response to therapy, we know that MS is really heterogeneous. So from a drug development standpoint, what's needed right now with regards to diagnostic and prognostic biomarkers? We already have um, MRI, magnetic um, resonance imaging, as a good tool for diagnosis and, and prognosis, you know, at least in, these, um, in terms of the focal inflammatory disease activity. Um, but you're right, additional tools are needed to understand the full spectrum of the disease, including tissue changes, uh, outside those local inflammatory lesions. Again, thinking about the more degenerative components of the disease. Um, we're currently developing such tools, advanced MRI methods, for example, looking at um, so-called phase rim lesions or advanced volum volumetric analysis, looking at impact of PET and, and metabolism, um, or then other tools like serum uh, neurofilament or expression profiling. Eventually, we'll also need an even deeper understanding of disease mechanisms. And, and I'm thinking of it as an, you know, the initial underlying trigger, then followed by the immunological reaction and the degenerative uh, process, right? Both of them. And, and we talked about which is the chicken and which is the egg. Um, and we need biomarkers and treatment approaches for all three of those compon components to eventually be successful. Right. So that's monitoring and, and diagnosis, but let's move into clinical trials because uh, obviously this is a major component. So the majority of drugs right now are approved for relapsing and remitting MS and additional drugs are needed for the progressive forms of the disease. So can you discuss the roadblocks in developing drugs and developing clinical trials specifically in MS? Yeah, and they're different for relapsing, remitting versus progressive. In, in relapsing MS, uh, the bar is actually quite high for new treatments with a need for differentiation and demonstrating superiority versus the established, even disease-modifying therapies, right? Um, so demonstrating efficacy on clinical endpoints is getting increasingly difficult um, with the active MRI-based disease management that's aiming to minimize clinical disease activity right now. Eventually, this is good news for patients as we have made substantial progress during this phase, but it's just a, a higher bar. Progressive MS has different challenges because the, the disability endpoints are moving more slowly and you have fewer patients available for clinical trials. 
At this point, we also don't have good tools that enable early go, no go decisions. And uh, even the preclinical disease models are, are less predictive in degenerative stages or progressive forms of the disease. At the same time, this is where the largest unmet need is for patients. So this is an area I think that will focus on um, in research and, and clinical development in the future. Well, now let's take a bit of a broader approach. So at Sanofi, you oversee a portfolio across immunology, hematology, oncology, rare diseases, and neurology. So MS in particular can be classified as both an autoimmune disease as well as a neurologic disorder. So how has your experience overseeing the development of drugs for particularly oncology, hematology, and immunology informed your approach to neuroscience? And how is Sanofi positioning itself with regards to building its neurology portfolio? Yeah, I, I think the experience in, in hematology and oncology and, and other areas has really helped me to understand the importance of scientific rigor, um, of quantifiable endpoints, and then targeting specific disease mechanism and keeping a close eye on the you know, relationship of PK, target engagement, and then eventually PD. You know, I, and I think we, we live finally in, a, in an age of biology and we're getting much deeper insights into key processes and pathways. And, and that's where you get into this overlap uh, between different therapeutic areas. For example, immunological mechanisms can play a key role across different therapeutic areas in immuno-oncology, in inflammatory systemic diseases, and now in neurology. And, and the same basic principles apply across those areas. For example, when you try to influence the B-cell or T-cell system, or even the, the tissue microenvironment. Now, your second question was, with regards to the position of Sanofi in neurology. And we're building our neurology portfolio in three areas where we think we can play to win. Um, we've also decided to focus on disease modifying treatments, much more than symptomatic treatments, since we feel they bring the most value to patients. The three focus areas for us are MS or neuroimmunological, neuroinflammatory diseases, then Parkinson's or synuclinopathies, and then genetically defined uh, diseases such as ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Huntington's. And we'll employ, and we're already employing, cutting edge science and develop treatments based on CNS penetrant small molecules like our BTK program, or then gene therapies, and perhaps also CNS targeted biologics. So another area that uh, Sanofi has considerable expertise in is rare diseases. So in particular, lysosomal storage diseases. So how can this information for rare and monogenic disorders be leveraged for common diseases like MS? Yeah, Sanofi has been at the forefront of, of rare disease treatments for years with therapies for disorders like Gaucher, Fabre, Pompe disease, etc. And there are more than 3,000 rare diseases that have been described and are in the NORD registry, for example. So there's still an, a large need for new treatment approaches. At the same time, our understanding of genetic drivers and potential therapeutic approaches has grown tremendously, and, and that gives us new tools and, and new targets to, to work with. A concrete example of how this translates, how our knowledge in rare diseases and lysosomal storage disorders is leveraged for more common diseases, is our phase two program with a drug called Venglustat that is primarily focused on diseases associated with lysosomal pathways, for example, Gaucher disease or gangliosidosis. But mutations in the GBA gene that's underlying here are also potent risk factors for GBA-associated Parkinson's disease and potentially for other forms of Parkinson's as well. Similarly, those lysosomal pathways play a role in cilial biology, which then leads us from rare diseases into more frequent disorders like autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. So you see all those um, connections that really are across those therapeutic yeah. areas. And in addition to what I'm talking about, which is really the same pathways being relevant for both rare and common diseases, when we genotype and identify more homogeneous subgroups, that may also lead to new treatments for more common and genetically complex diseases, including MS and other neurological disorders, I think. Great. So taking a bit of an even broader perspective, how has the R&D landscape evolved with respect to collaborative approaches 
and particularly who are the key stakeholders with respect to MS? I fully agree. Given the complexity of what we're trying to achieve, collaborative uh, approaches are important and, and will gain in importance. Risk sharing is an important um, parameter here and then practical collaborations, for example, regarding active comparators, and those are likely to be more and more common also in neurology and MS. Oncology, by the way, has been leading here also when it comes to combination therapies, right? Because you combine different principles to then address different mechanisms of action at the same time. Um, when we think about concretely which collaborations are important in, in MS and, and neurology, I'm primarily thinking of consortia and collaborations with the uh, representation of patients, academia, and governance. And, and those are established and, and will continue to be established. And some examples are the Progressive MS Alliance uh, mm -hmm. or the Critical Path Institute or the, the Inno Innovative Medicines Initiative, the IMI. So finally, a uh, two-part question. So what do you see as the biggest challenges facing drug development in neuroscience? And let's end on a positive note. So let's project 10, 20 years from now. What are you excited right now about and what changes and developments are you looking forward to seeing uh, implemented in the future? Yeah, first of all, I see neuroscience as a, a large unmet, large area of unmet medical need and a real opportunity. And with this deeper and deeper understanding of the biology, I think we are now in neuroscience where we were in, for example, oncology 20 years ago, right? And, and I, I think it's a really important area um, for us to, to work in. Now, sensitive and reliable and clinically relevant endpoints may be one of the biggest challenges in drug development in neuroscience. And digital endpoints, when you, when you think about apps or accelerometers or you know, movement trackers, um, and then better imaging and you know, soluble biomarkers, for example, neurofilament, will hopefully help to overcome some of these challenges. I'm also excited about the prospects of, of gene therapy for neurological diseases, both you know, in the short term with AAV vectors, but then also in the longer term when we think about kind of gene therapy 2.0 approaches, whether it's lentivirus or even non-viral approaches. And in 10 to 20 years, we will most likely have some key successes in a variety of rare monogenic disorders, and we will move to some of the more common and genetically complex neurological diseases. And the ability to treat some of those previously untreatable and severe diseases is one of the things that, that excites me most, right? Today, we have multiple treatments for spinal muscular atrophy, for SMA. And in 10 to 20 years, we may well have effective treatments for ALS, for Huntington's, and also for some of the neurodevelopmental or neurodegenerative disorders and synucleinopathies like Parkinson's. That's, I hope, where we'll be in 10 to 20 years. It's, it's exciting. And um, I, th I think everything you've said is a, a very distinct possibility. So with that, I want to thank you again for your time today, Dietmar. It's really encouraging to see what developments are being made in MS and more broadly how the neuroscience R&D landscape is evolving and adapting as we learn more about this disease. So thanks again. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Dietmar and Kevin, for your inspiring discussions. As Kevin said, it's really encouraging to see developments made in MS treatments. And exciting to hear from Dietmar that neuroscience R&D is making significant strides. Indeed, despite COVID-19, so far USFDA has approved eight treatments for neurological disorders, including the first drug for MF, the first oral medicine for SMA, and another treatment option for MS. Which brings us to these questions. What urgent needs remain unmet from clinical and patient perspectives? And how we can ensure the resources are directed towards what matters most to patients? Please join me in welcoming our next panel. Cindy Zajoboino, President and CEO of the National MS Society, and three of the leading MS physicians in the US and Canada, Dr. Chitnitz, Dr. Friedman, and Dr. Green. This panel will be moderated by Mandy Jackson, Managing Editor of the U.S. Commercial News at The Pink Sheet and The Script. Hello, welcome to our discussion of clinical prospects and multiple sclerosis. My name is Mandy Jackson, and I'm the Managing Editor of U.S. Commercial News for Script and The Pink Sheet, and I'll moderate our discussion today. Multiple sclerosis can be difficult to diagnose, and 
the patients have benefited from new disease modifying therapies, though many unmet needs still remain. We will hear from our speakers today about gaps in diagnosis and treatment, as well as promising science and technology that is emerging to address patients' needs. With us today are Dr. Tanuja Chitnis, who is professor at uh, Harvard Medical School, director of the Partners Pediatric MS Center at Massachusetts General Hospital for Children. She also sees adult patients with MS at Brigham and Women's Hospital and serves on the board of directors of the America's Committee for Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis, or ACTRIMS, which recently held its annual joint meeting with its European counterpart, ACTRIMS. Dr. Mark Friedman, a professor of medicine and neurology at the University of Ottawa, director of the Multiple Sclerosis Research Unit at Ottawa Hospital General Campus and senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. He is president-elect of Actrims. Dr. Ari Green, who is the distinguished professor of neurology and ophthalmology, chief of the division of neuroimmunology and glial biology in the Department of Neurology, medical director of the University of California at San Francisco Multiple Sclerosis and Neuroinflammation Center, and a translational scientist focused on the development of regenerative and restorative therapies for people with MS and related disorders. His team led the only successful remyelinating trial in MS to date. And Cindy Zagiboilo, president and CEO of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society in the U.S. So to kick things off, let's, let's talk about how difficult is it to diagnose MS and what is changing in this area to more rapidly and precisely diagnose patients? What else would be immediately helpful in this area? Uh, Cindy, can we start with you? Sure, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. And I'll just say that fast diagnosis is critical to minimize MS and the disease that, that the symptoms that can, that can occur. So from my perspective, I would say um, to start with heightened awareness that diagnosis and treatment early in this disease is critically important. People having access to an MS specialist is so important and, and linkages with general neurologists will help us speed diagnosis. Another thing I'd like to mention around this is that we need to dispel myths about who gets MS. Awareness that black people get MS in a, in, at a similar prevalence rate as Caucasians, although the presentation may be different, um, we, we need to heighten that awareness because early diagnosis is just so very critical. Goodness, what progress are you seeing in, in the area of diagnosis? I think uh, in general, diagnostic criteria has certainly improved in the past 10 years and uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, initially MS was diagnosed just by clinical symptoms. Then MRI was added in. Then CSF profiles were re-added into this. And now we're starting to see some evidence that blood biomarkers might be helpful in this diagnostic phase, but this is, there's still a lot of work to be done in that we don't have one blood biomarker that distinguishes MS from other entities. There are, there are also advances in antibody testing for other diseases that commonly mimic MS, and so given that sort of um, ability to look at a set of uh, both clinical and blood as well as MRI features, uh, diagnosis has improved. But as you can sort of hear from what I'm saying, it requires a specialist to put all of this information together. And so having a general neurologist or even a family practitioner um, start to diagnose MS can be challenging. And this is where there still is a delay in diagnosis. So I echo what Cindy uh, has said, that early diagnosis is critical uh, for initiation of early treatment, which we know has benefits long term. And then I'll also add that we are seeing a lot of patients who have what's called radiologically isolated syndrome. They have uh, incidentally um, uh, presented with an MRI that shows MS-like lesions and brought to a neurologist attention. They've not had clinical symptoms yet. And this shows us that MS likely, very likely starts years before the initial full clinical attack. And probably if we are able to identify those people and treat them, appropriately early on, and again, we have a better chance of mitigating or reducing disability in the long term. Dr. Friedman, do you have anything to add here? Um, well, I, I completely agree with everything Tanuja mentioned. Having served on the last McDonald's uh, committee, I can tell you that our 
biggest concern was not so much our ability to diagnose, but all the uh, misdiagnosis. And, and we really focused on accuracy of diagnosis. The last thing you want to do is put that label on someone when it doesn't belong. And we were willing to sacrifice uh, some degree of sensitivity so that the criteria may not fully diagnose everyone, but specificity had to be as high as possible so that when you do make the diagnosis, you're pretty darn sure that it is MS. And there's just too much of a, uh, I will say, um, knee jerk, sorry, I had to say it's ne neurology, uh, a reaction for many people who just simply order MRIs for the wrong reasons. Then you get these images that are with a long list of differential diagnoses often presented by the radiologist to make sure that they've covered everything. That's even the, the remote possibilities. And uh, someone latches on to the possibility that this is MS so that now suddenly a patient who probably doesn't have the disease has symptoms that wouldn't necessarily to add up to MS, gets a diagnosis by MRI, and the next thing you know is they're placed on a treatment that could cause them some harm. So it's really important that we don't rely on laboratory measures alone, that this is very much a clinical diagnosis, that a patient has to have symptoms and signs that are consistent with central nervous system demyelination. And then we use our tools, our, our hands, our examination, our experience, the MRI, the biomarkers, anything, you know, the, the other tests, including spinal fluid, to either reassure us that we're not dealing with another entity that could mimic MS or show us all the things that we would expect to see should a patient have MS, but not rely on those laboratory markers to make the diagnosis. Dr. Green, did you have anything to add here as well? Yeah, I, I think uh, my colleagues and Cindy have beautifully summarized, you know, where things stand. I, I would only add that, you know, 150 years ago when MS was first described and in probably the first uh, nearly 100 years of the disease, the diagnosis was almost strictly pathological for the confirmation of the disease. I mean, obviously there was a clinical sense of who had MS, but really knowing for sure was, was uh, dependent on pathology. And the refinement of the clinical criteria really starting in the 1950s and 60s and on to the 80s and 90s and today has really helped us to... to do exactly what Mark was touching on, which is identify who um, who has MS and who who we can uh, who we can confirm has MS, and yet at the same time ensure exactly what Cindy touched on, which is treat people as early as possible. Which the evidence is overwhelming now that that's uh, important for prevention of uh, brain injury. Well, how has uh, treatment of MS changed as a new disease modifying drugs have become available, and what urgent needs still are unmet from physician and patient perspectives, there's fatigue, I know, was a big concern as well as uh, stopping disease progression, but each patient experiences the disease differently. Um, uh, Dr. Chitnis, can you uh, start? Yeah, so MS treatments has certainly uh, just exploded in the past 20 years since I started to practice in the field when there was one or two treatments and now we have close to 20. Um, and it's wonderful as an MS clinician to be able to choose between different treatments with different um, both efficacy as well as side effect profiles and find the right treatment that, that, that actually fits the patient's uh, disease profile. I think with that, um, some additional matching uh, is needed and that's where the concept of precision medicine comes in that I know we're going to talk about later in more depth, but um, finding the right treatment for the right patient at the right time, I think that was one of Mark's uh, papers, um, is really something that we as MS clinicians uh, are hopefully getting better at. I think the gaps in terms of MS treatments still remain. Um, we would like to understand uh, who benefits from high efficacy early treatment, and we have a sense that that type of treatment, if it is safe, does eventually uh, probably give us better long-term outcomes in terms of disability and quality of life. But that those are several studies that are ongoing to really define and prove that point. I think around the, the missing gaps, certainly treatments for progressive MS, or you know, that, that's a challenging concept and there's probably many mechanisms that are at play in progressive MS but essentially slowing disability accrual that's unrelated to relapses and eventually improving 
um, neurological function is important. And finally, improving quality of life for patients at all um, stages and levels of disease is very important. And fatigue is certainly a major symptom that uh, patients continue to experience constantly. I will also say that psychosocial issues and depression, anxiety are also quite prevalent and understanding how to manage those within an MS population is critical. Dr. Green, you were just nodding your head, so I'll, I'll ask you to speak next. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, Dr. Chetnis has, has uh, summarized that really well. I, I, I guess what I would add is, you know, there's a one feature of having lots of different choices, is the potential for uh, paralyzed choice making. So the capacity to differentiate and distinguish who should be on which therapy is a crucial area of development. The other thing is, you know, we've, we've made this huge inroad in terms of therapy. It used to be that 50% of our patients at 15 to 20 years have significant or major disability or we're making a transition into a relentless disabling progressive course of their disease. And, and uh, now we're probably pushing that out uh, based on data um, from a bunch of different sites, including our own and, and, and Dr. Chitness's in, in, uh, in Boston, which it's clear that we're pushing things out by a decade or two in terms of when people enter that progressive disabling stage. But they still, despite our most potent therapies, still patients have both progression in the early phase of the disease and long-term progressive disability um, at, you know, or, or major disability milestones at 20, 30 years of, of having the disease. And so that leaves this major unmet need of needing to have restorative and regenerative therapies. Um, and I think that's the, the to me, that's the, the, the next uh, huge hurdle for us to overcome. We're making progress, but it's, it's really where uh, I think uh, a huge amount of resources need to be dedicated. Well, and certainly these are uh, pretty young patients relatively uh, with this kind of a disease. So uh, there's, there's certainly a need to uh, push progression out as far as possible. Dr. Friedman, can you talk a little bit about um, sort of unmet needs in terms of treatment? Well, I'm, uh, I, I'd like to say that I have probably a little more gray hair than my two colleagues here. And uh, I entered the treatment arena, or at least the MS arena, at a time when there were no treatments. And then we had the era of the uh, injectables, a huge breakthrough. We, we go after our young scientists. Uh, Actrums has really been focusing on our, our young researchers, trying to get enough people out there with that kind of knowledge that we could apply it properly and get these patients the kind of management that they need. So yes, we have very effective therapies, but we want to know how to implement them early and we want them in the hands of people who know what they're doing so that our patients get the best uh, best chance at, at, at curbing their disease early and preventing that progression. Well, Cindy, you know, outside of the clinic for the patients in their daily lives, what, what are you seeing as the most urgent need uh, among the community of patients? Well, I, it's consistent with what, you know, what Mark just offered. We need, um, first of all, more MS specialists would be helpful. People who can take care of people. There just aren't enough. At least in the United States, there are just not enough. And, and we need greater consensus on standards of MS care. So if we could describe what they are, and you know, we don't know this yet, the right, there's too, much, too many variables, but if we could describe what the standard of MS care is, we could more easily instruct, train, provide distance learning, connect with community neurologists so that they can administer that complex care that is that is is complex one of the tragedies that we have on the one hand we have this great so many options like like Tanuja described we have so many options now that's wonderful on the other hand there is enormous stress that is caused when people feel they're they're given an overwhelming number of options and they're asked to figure out and participate in their own care at a level that they're not prepared to do it puts the physicians in a very difficult position position it puts patients in a really hard place that can be incredibly overwhelming and can i think uh, mark just described this it can paralyze people it can just paralyze people from moving forward so that is something Thing we need to figure out how to overcome. Simplifying the diagnosis, ensuring immediate treatment, and, um, and making sure that that treatment is aligned and the most effective for that person at that time. There's still a lot of things to figure out. Andy, if I could just extend for a second that, because I think one comment that's super important there too is, as Cindy was touching on, more need for people with specialist training. 
that's even more pronounced, I think, for our international settings and outside of uh, the US and Europe, where the disease is probably underrecognized and you know, due to the benefits of globalization and uh, industrialization, I mean, the disease is really a disease of the industrialized world. And as, as across the world, people industrialize, we see way more autoimmunity developing and we see way more of these uh, diseases like MS. And we, we just need the specialists and the training for people to be able to identify it so they can get appropriate treatment. Well, how can patients reinforce the urgency of addressing some of these really crucial needs and, you know, whether it's from the diagnostic or the therapeutic perspective or, or other kinds of treatments to get at these disabling, the disabling weakness and fatigue and things that, that are urgent needs now, how can, how can patients really lend a hand to um, help develop better treatment all around? Cindy, can you? Yeah, I'll start with that. That's great. In general, and not just in MS, but in general, people are finding their voices in engaging in their own medical care. And this is critically important. Um, the doctor-patient relationship is becoming more of an equal partnership and with greater transparency. And we understand that knowledge and awareness of what's going on is powerful and that people can contribute to their own solutions. When we have a group of people together and we put a problem in the middle of the table and the problem is presented by a person who has MS, I have this symptom, I have this concern, and, and the experts come around, we can solve it more quickly. So just the convening, the describing what your life is like, what you'd like to achieve in your life, expressing symptoms, being able to talk about those and engaging others and helping to solve, that's a big part of this, how we're gonna get answers. Dr. Green, from your perspective, uh, how, how can the patients lend a hand and, and help on the, the scientific yeah. and treatment side? Well, I think it's definitely that in the, at the individual level, it's the partnership with the physician. At a, at, a more, um, at a broader level, I think patients have to make sure that, they're being, that their concerns and their issues and their, and their worries and, and the problems they face are getting recognized. That includes what uh, Cindy touched on earlier about fatigue and other symptoms that need management to improve quality of life. It also includes the recognition that, you know, we used to fo focus all of our attention in terms of what we want to prevent is keeping people out of wheelchairs. And, and that's an important goal or, or was an important goal for an era where we had no therapies as Mark was touching on. But now that we have therapies, we really want to avoid even more moderate or even milder disabilities that may be hidden from people who, you know, who it's not obvious to people who see a patient with MS necessarily to have MS, but it impairs someone's capacity to go for a hike or go for a bike ride or, or enjoy walking on the beach. And those kind of things, it, it might seem more trivial, maybe to a prior generation or to people who, um, who, who have lived with MS, who have serious progressive disease, but the people with more moderate disability we need to hear them and we need to develop therapies that help address their issues. Again, that gets to that reversal of progression and that recovery and the prevention of their long-term uh, progressive disability. That seems to me to be uh, um, the crucial boundary that we need to pass. Well, it, you touched on it a little bit, but are the needs very much different depending on whether you're talking about a relapsing, remitting MS patient versus progressive MS? And, pediatric versus adult patients. Dr. Chitness, maybe you can talk about this since you treat children as well as adults. Yes, and I'll add that uh, we do, we are seeing a larger number of pediatric MS patients. It's partly because of the increased recognition, better diagnostic criteria. But I think we also have to wonder if this population is increasing for other reasons. Um, Ari mentioned industrialization is a factor and we are seeing that obesity is a risk factor for MS in general, and particularly obesity during adolescence. And um, you know, I think that combined with studies looking at diet and the microbiome and other factors does lead one to think about this industrial pressure um, and leading to MS. So I am seeing uh, a number of kids with MS as well as uh, many practitioners around the world. And um, it's really critical to recognize that this is a very highly inflammatory disease. Uh, children have two or three times as many relapses as a typical adult patient does. Of course, it's a continuum. And, um, and this is where it's critical to treat patients with effective drugs uh, safely and as early as possible. 
And that is where early pediatric trials come in. And uh, we've participated in a number of these uh, to help to bring new therapies to children and really adolescents with MS that are safe and effective. So I think with that being said, the, the early relapsing phase of MS um, certainly responds best to highly effective anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, but there's still probably a role for neuroprotection, for potentially remyelination in this early phase, since every attack, every hit does, uh, does damage the central nervous system to some degree. Later on, the inflammatory phase does decrease with age. I think you know that's a generality and every patient is different, but that's in general. And that's where possibly the highly inflammatory or highly anti-inflammatory drugs are not as crucial. And there is um, a thought around de-escalation of therapy or even stopping therapy at uh, a certain age, maybe 60 or 50, but that's still in, in study and to be determined. But I think there's this concept that we will, we will pare down or change different therapies as patients age and potentially add on more neuroprotection during this aging process. Dr. Green, did you have something to add there? You mean in terms of uh, the different needs of, of different patient populations? Yeah, right. I, I, I think uh, Tanuja touched on it beautifully and, and, and there are clearly different needs for pediatric uh, patients and, and adult patients. But in, in addition, I'd say we've got to focus on something that we've touched on a little bit, which is that each patient has their own unique uh, course of the disease and their own unique story and their own unique um, pattern of damage and injury. And so personalizing care and thinking about a personalized approach uh, becomes crucial and developing ways of deeply phenotyping each individual patient so that we know what their, you know, where their damage and injury is and, and we can focus our attention on how to address it and developing those biomarkers for how do you measure damage and injury in different pathways. It's the multiple part of multiple sclerosis can sometimes get overlooked and the fact that there's diffuse damage and injury. And so how do we, again, focus on the fact that it's a multifocal disease, but with patterns of damage and injury that is uh, different in each individual and, and trying to address that is crucial. Wow. Well, Mandy, just to build on that, if I could, just sure. to build on that so much, I think because MS is, we do have courses of the disease that we describe but each person has a unique set of symptoms. So Ari talked about this a little bit earlier, that depending on what a person wants to achieve in their life, that walk on that beach, the dance with their daughter, the ability to keep working, you know, whatever they do, and what their symptoms are, the intersection of those. So one of the challenges that many people have is that their symptoms are invisible. Somebody can run a marathon, but they can't add a column of numbers because they are experiencing cognitive fog or, you know, so it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's a challenging disease to approach. And that's the way we have to approach it. We have to look at what does a person have, want to achieve in their life? What is their problem? And what is a potential solution to that? Which is managing, managing symptoms. And of course, minimizing, eliminating disease progression as part of all of that. So it's, it's, it's a complex treatment that includes the whole person and the relationships. Well, how have patients become involved in the development of, of, of new treatments and, and diagnostics? And when I say treatments, not just drugs, but other non-drug interventions like digital technologies or physical therapy and real rehabilitation, how have they put their voice forward and said, these are the things that, that really help for us? Well, part of it is being able to describe it, you know, and insisting that how fast I walk in 20 feet is not who I am. It's not everything I need. And being able to talk about that and describe that and advocate for it, um, let in, and uh, inspire, inspire researchers and people who wanna help to solve these clear problems as they're put forward. It's not, it's not simple, but working together, bringing every, every um, perspective together to think about what it is we're trying to accomplish will will accelerate progress in all areas. And that really touches on a crucially important point, which is a lot of what we have missed in MS or is what's difficult to see or measure at the bedside. And so we've ignored a lot of the different features of the disease. When I came into the disease, a heavy focus in, in my own clinical practice and in, in my own research was in the visual system. 
And some people would say, well, why are you focused on the visual system? People get, you know, they, they end up with a cane, they end up with a wheelchair, they don't end up blind. And the reality is a lot of people have significant and, uh, and profound visual impairment, but it was ignored because it was tougher to measure and even more pronounced for the cognitive deficits and something we don't even like to talk about, which is sometimes the behavioral and mental health co consequences of disease. Mm -hmm. And so as we move forward with therapies, exactly what Cindy was touching on, we've got to develop the therapeutic approaches that attend to those individual needs, recognize it is a whole brain disease and the you know, brain as a highly complex organ underlies so much of what makes us human and so much of what, of what uh, permits us to live our best life. Dr. Friedman, how have you seen patients um, become involved in bringing new treatments forward? It's very difficult to move forward in, in any kind of a, a granting process for researchers if you're not involving a, a patient or a group of patients sitting and looking and reviewing and understanding rationale for certain research and, and getting them to, uh, I think, buy in and weigh in and say, what would the impact of this research be for you? And so they're sitting on committees. They're up front. They're, they're, uh, it's, and it's very strongly suggested when you submit a grant now to either the national uh, uh, CIHR, which is our, our equivalent to, I guess, your MRC or, or uh, NIH, uh, and, and or the uh, MS Society that you have involved a patient or a, pa a group of patients who could contribute to this. So not only are they right up front now looking at the, the uh, process of getting money to researchers, but they're also getting involved in clinical trials. We need them desperately to enroll, uh, especially in, in the uh, trials that we're doing today with a progressive disease. We, we need their buy-in for that. We need their patients, uh, not just them, but their patients, because these trials are very tedious to do. We need their buy-in to that. We need their understanding of what a PRO is, and we need their help to develop good PROs so that we're getting at that cognitive fog that, that Cindy talked about. We're getting at measures of fatigue. We're getting at, at, at some of the more nebulous symptoms of pain and how that involves them on a day-to-day -day basis because we don't have good measure, measurements objectively. So we're going to have to go to these PROs and we need our patients' help to do those. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'll add to that, I think that um, beyond, as Mark had mentioned, beyond clinical trials, which are crucial for, uh, for us and, and really patients to understand which drugs might be beneficial, there is a really a real importance to participating in studies related to the natural history of MS, um, understanding biomarkers, biorepositories, and both Dr. Green and I are very involved in long-term biorepository studies uh, at our centers, and others around the world are doing the same thing. But these sort of studies will help us to understand the heterogeneity amongst MS patients who has cognitive difficulties, who is more likely to have visual difficulties or walking difficulties, and then also developing these types of uh, novel measures that will ultimately help in, in um, bringing new clinical trials or different cl clinical trial strategies to the forefront. Well, what other kind of collaborations could be helpful uh, in advancing the field and, and meeting some of these needs? Are there better opportunities to bring together stakeholders, you know, in addition to patients and physicians and academics, regulators and biotechnology companies as well to work together. Um, I know a lot of that work is ongoing, but um, surely there are, is a need for more collaboration or different types of collaboration to push things forward. Um, maybe Cindy, you can talk a little bit about well, that. I think, um, you know, convening and sharing information, data sharing is really important. We just, we're seeing how much we're learning about COVID and MS because we have registries that we set up to be able to harmonize those registries. And we can look at what have we do, did it very, very quickly because of the urgent need. We can do this. We can increase data sharing um, in NMS and we, do, we are doing better, but that, that will accelerate progress terrifically as, as one of the additional pieces. That and just getting together and sharing results. So the the scientific meetings are critically important and and uh and um uh more opportunities for people to get together in smaller groups and more often to share what they're learning is is going to continue to accelerate 
we have these snapshot views when they come into the clinic, but the, the notion that they have a dynamic disease that fluctuates day to day, might there be an opportunity for artificial intelligence to capture some of this? And, and what about a company that's willing to devote the resources to develop such things? That's the kind of partnership that will advance and get us a handle on, on uh, our patients in, in the long run that we can't possibly get from say two or three visits a year. So partnerships like that, uh, obviously for innovative ways of evaluating people. And I think the rest is quite endless. If you start to bring in uh, the physicists who understand some of the disabilities and can, can uh, I, I had this wonderful interaction with this fellow and who's a, both an engineer and a neurologist who had conceptualized ways in which to deal with some people's individual disabilities and make life easier for them. Uh, getting them involved and, and partnering with them, uh, you could just, the, the sky's the limit when you can start thinking about the kinds of interactions and understanding that we can gain from even a basic chemist who, who might have a, an idea about uh, a compound that will deal with a symptom that we can't currently treat. Dr. Yeah. Green, did you have something to add here too? Absolutely. So and beyond information technology, I think um, robotics and engineering are going to be crucial for aiding our patients who have significant or profound disability. And so uh, we've got to have partnerships and, and engagement with people who understand the limits of those approaches as well as the potential applications. Um, in addition to that kind of engineering approach, we need engineers to help us with developing those new sensitive biomarkers that I think a few of us have spoken about. So in fact, I have a member of my laboratory, strictly engineer, trained PhD, who's become conversant in the biology of MS so that she can uh, develop an approach for making measurements that are extraordinarily fine and that could be used for long-term tracking. And then the last part is, I think we're really missing, uh, we have great collaboration between uh, the pharmaceutical companies and individual investigators and academic uh, locations and people who seek high volumes of patients, but a real uh, in the dirt kind of engagement between biotech and, 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 and bench side discoveries and um, clinicians in the field, like what we see in cancer, I think is missing from our field. I think there's not quite enough of it. There's not quite enough of that uh, regular engagement and conversation. This is across neuroscience, clinical neuroscience, but it's, I think the place where it could really hit pay dirt is in, uh, is in MS because we've shown success in the past. So there's the capacity to do something important, but we need that engagement with the biotech community directly with uh, people who understand the disease and the challenges that patients are facing. Well, in the spirit of uh, bringing people together to talk about um, MS, um, after the recent joint actrums actrums meeting, um, what were some of the themes discussed during the conference that you, you think could have an impact on diagnosis and treatment, Dr. Chinnis? I think the, the recent Actrums Actrums um, MS virtual meeting highlighted a couple of themes for me. I think one is the concept of precision medicine, and we've seen in cancer therapeutics and cancer in general that this is uh, really advanced significantly. We're just starting to see that in MS and developing biomarkers that will predict or associate with new relapses and predict progression and help us to stratify or identify the right treatments for patients are now uh, being advanced. And there were several presentations around both blood-based biomarkers as well as MRI biomarkers that might help to do that and help physicians to, to really stratify and identify patients at high risk for any of these events. I think that to me was one of the major themes. Another really interesting area is the microbiome and I think the the effect of um, both the, the gut microbiota as well as the uh, lumen and various cells um, that populate the gut um, is showing us that that is an important organ in MS and we need to pay attention not only to our diets but maybe even modifying and uh, thinking about therapeutics that would affect the gut in particular. Dr. Friedman, what did you take from, away from the conference? Actually, it was a, an incredible meeting. It was one of the few conferences I actually got to most of the lectures. Because what happens when we put a whole bunch of specialists in one spot, everybody takes advantage and has meetings. And you end up missing all the talks and presentations. And you have to go back and do it afterwards. But I did it in real time. I actually really enjoyed a few areas. Uh, right from the kickstart, where uh, one of my uh, country uh, compatriots talked about the MS prodrome. 
And how intriguing is that, that uh, for years before patients ever actually present, there's very good evidence that they are already afflicted by the disease before they actually come out with a, an episode that really says, oh, this is MS. They utilize more healthcare services. They're more depressed. They, they I, I mean, the, the list went on. It was a wonderful lecture, but there's good evidence that this could last years before the first real opportunity for the disease to express itself. Uh, a lot of those symptoms are not things that you would attribute to MS. We've seen, um, we, we've seen a study years ago from the Argentinian pediatric group, and you will remember this, that before they express their first episode of MS, they've already seen a decline in their grades going back three, four years. So there's a cognitive issue that comes out very early. Uh, from the use of uh, healthcare services in Canada, which you can track because we have a national health service, you can see them drawing on psychiatrists and coming to the hospital more with general aches and pains. This is all part of the prodrome. And what really hit home was that when, if you look at any one of those biomarkers, one of the most promising one being serum neurofilament light. So there's evidence of this prodrome that, can, that we need to tap into. We, we, clearly our diagnostic criteria are missing uh, a number of people for that crucial early diagnosis and introduction of therapy. Uh, there is a lot of talk about remyelination, repair, regeneration. There's not enough of that. We are in dire need of something that will repair, uh, regenerate, and, and you know, renew, and all these uh, kinds of activities that are being done and researched in animals need to translate into the human trials. And we're starting to see these. Ari is, is you know, uh, one of the first people to be able to bring one of those forward. So I see a direct link between that program and, and the remyelination and repair topic, because I think the fact that by the time we diagnose someone, by the time we first even have an opportunity to see them in the clinic, there's a ready injury, means we've got to be tackling this problem of regeneration and repair if we're going to keep people, you know, ha having uh, healthy lives that are equivalent to their peers. So that's, that's one of the reasons that I think it's a, a major motivator. And I, that was a part of the meeting that I, I you know, I, I was... Uh, it was really exciting to see the number of different people who were becoming engaged and uh, and and focused on this topic because we need great minds from from uh, from all sides, people who've had a ton of experience to help us advance that uh, it, 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 it advance that target. Well, it seems like there uh, there's a lot um, a lot of options out there for looking at new ways to tackle the disease. How outside of uh, things like remyelination and pharmaceutical approaches. Um, what sort of um, non-pharma approaches are out there? Uh, things like digital technologies and sleep trackers and activity trackers and wearable devices and apps and all of those. I mean, uh, Cindy, maybe you can talk a little bit about how patients are embracing technology to, um, to help them in their disease. Well, I think um, one of the big areas that we're focused on now is just lifestyle choices that people make. So it's not necessarily just technology. It's a, how do you live your everyday life? How are you eating? How are you exercising? How does that affect your symptoms that you're having? So there, and there are a lot of technical tools that support people with, with that, you know, being, you know, uh, to Gina um, described earlier how weight can be a factor for, you know, especially obesity during during um, adolescence affects whether or not people get MS, but obesity in general can be a big problem for people with any chronic disease and certainly with MS. So those kinds of the technology that links people together to, to solve a lifestyle issue, to lose weight, to be part of a group, to get that social support. Um, to, to address their depression that they might be having, to make connections, that is, those are really important areas for people who have MS. Um, well, I did want to go back to personalized medicine a little bit and, and ask about how you're using that now in practice. In what ways are you trying to personalize treatment, um, given that uh, it, it, personalized medicine we think of more, I think, in cancer, but um, it, there are, I know there are companies that are trying to look at personalized approaches and um, certainly each patient has individual needs. Um, Dr. Friedman, could you talk about that a bit? Well, uh, I think actually the theme of our Actors Forum last year was personalized medicine and 
to how we're evolving. And, and people would think, oh, well, we're far away from it. Uh, in, in cancer, they have an advantage. They take the tumor out. They, they, they can see the genetic composition. They can go after that gene. They can see which patient's going to respond to which drug. Um, yeah, they have it a little bit easier, but, but all of that is starting to happen now for uh, multiple sclerosis. We just uh, published our treatment optimization recommendations on how to manage MS all across Canada. That just came out a couple of months ago. Uh, and it involves um, a number of steps. And, and the, the early steps is important is to just profile your patient. They're all unique, exactly what Cindy was saying. They all present differently. They all bring different things to the table. And we have to look at that whole package. It's not just, let's pick this drug for that, but this is not maybe the right drug for this patient. They're not gonna comply with this therapy. They're not gonna follow the recommended monitoring. They, they're traveling too much. This is a, an issue with vaccinations. And so it's, it really is looking at the entire package. Uh, we have certain markers. Markers are the way the disease present clinically the way in which the, the uh, uh, silent disease manifests on MRI. We have a biomarker that can give us prognostic. We've shown that the higher serum neurofilament level at baseline predicts an early progression that might confer a, um, a choice of a therapy that might be a little more aggressive, but in that particular individual, it's warranting it. So it's not something I can summarize in 30 seconds, but we really are moving towards that as we gain more information about the natural history of the disease, how it presents, how it manifests in individuals, and then we tailor it down to that particular patient who's sitting in front of us. And we work together with the patient to come up with the best formula for them. Well, we're nearing the end of our time, but I did want to give each of you um, an opportunity to, to sort of uh, look into your crystal ball a bit and, and give, you know, where, where do you see the field five or 10 years from now, what, what is your pr prediction for um, progress, I guess, we hopefully will make for patients? And Dr. Chitness, I'll start with you. I think it, MS has certainly advanced in the past 20 years significantly, and I'll, I'll say in another 10 years, there's going to be even more advances. Uh, I see that patients will have many more treatment choices. I think we will get better at personalizing those treatment choices and assigning the right treatment or treatments at the right time and combining these with um, paraclinical strategies like diet and exercise and um, others. And I do see also an AI approach to an algorithm approach, which would help clinicians to make these decisions. So I think large databases um, really bringing in biomarkers, different algorithms um, will help uh, both patients and physicians to reach the best choices. Thanks, then. And Cindy, from the patient perspective, you know, what, what is your hope or expectation for five or 10 years from now? Well, I am an eternal optimist. I've been in this field, you know, as probably as long as Mark, well before, since 1985, we had nothing. People weren't diagnosed. The progress that we've made since then has been extraordinary, more than any other neurological disease. And the progress is accelerating you can hear one of the things that, that, that was discussed at least peripherally and starting to say it out loud, researchers are saying it out loud, that, a, that there's a potential for a cure. And using that cure world, word is huge and, and can inspire enormous hope for the field. And we are a strong MS movement with great respect. You could hear it among the, the, the researchers and clinicians here, that the enormous respect for people who are trying to live their best lives, who have MS, for the industry, for the academic research, for all the different components of, that are gonna contribute to solutions. And that's powerful. Together, we'll make even more progress moving forward to get to that cure eventually. Dr. Friedman, do you wanna talk? I just wanted to say that what we're seeing evolve with the different therapies today, uh, I think we're, the future will tell us a little bit more about what mechanism may be at play in our patients. So we're better selecting the kind of drug that will address that mechanism. Uh, we, we are looking at not only medicines that curb inflammation, the damage, but we're now looking at medicines that might offer repair. I can see combining these two. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't. We know that damage is occurring even before the patient begins. So we'd want to start with a reparative together with something that will curb the inflammation. 
We may even consider looking at some of the drugs that we have today that work via different mechanisms and combine them safely because we don't know maybe which mechanism may be operating, but if you hit two or three at a time, you'll have a better success than any one therapy by itself. That was the lesson that HIV taught us years ago. So I, I can see the field evolving a little bit more in that way, direction, and it, it speaks to this precision medicine that we are seeking for MS. Dr. Green, do you have a final word for us? Sure thing. Yeah, so I, I would just uh, second the opinion. This is an extraordinarily exciting time uh, in MS research. Uh, I got started in MS research in the late 80s and early 90s, and there was a lot uh, that uh, was needed to be done at that moment. And there's still a, a lot that needs to be done, but we've made huge progress. And I, and I think the opportunity for uh, that next generation of therapies is right around the corner. It has to be grounded in not just good, but great science. I think we've got to continue to push for great scientific breakthroughs. The, again, that opportunity is there. It's going to take uh, coordination between uh, governmental support and, and, and patient advocacy groups and, uh, and, and corporate and private interests to help push that all forward along with uh, those of us who care for patients with MS and people with MS. But it, but it is around the corner, and I think if we, if we keep that target in mind, um, I do think this will be the area that will teach the rest of neuroscience about how to tackle these degenerative diseases that are otherwise, you know, probably the greatest unmet medical need, not just in our area, but across all of medicine. Well, thank you all for participating, and thank you for Wuxi for hosting us today. Thank you, Mandy, Cindy, Dr. Chitty, Dr. Green, and Dr. Friedman for an inspiring discussion. As you have highlighted, progress in MS diagnosis and treatment have significantly accelerated over the years. While we still have a long way to go in finding a cure for MS, the next generation of therapies are emerging right around the corner. And as Dr. Green pointed out, future advances need to be grounded in great scientific breakthroughs. Now let's turn to our final session on science which will examine how scientific insights have led us to the treatment options as we have today, and how emerging technologies may lead us to more effective and personalized opportunities. Rich Saw, head of Wuxi Aptech Boston office, will host this panel discussion, together with Professor Hertz at UT Southwestern Medical Center, Dr. Kern, CMO for Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics, Dr. Noreen, CSO of Pipeline Therapeutics, and Dr. Ramanastan, Global Program Head at Neuroscience and Novartis. Okay, welcome to the third session of uh, today's webinar, Multiple Sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, in fact, is a chronic disease that occurs when the body's immune system behaves abnormally and attacks the brain, the spinal cord, the optic nerves of the central nervous system. And as we learned earlier, it's the leading cause of nervous system related disability in young people. The biology is very complex. The cause of MS is, uh, is not well characterized. Both genetics and environments appear to contribute to risk. More than 50 genes are known to increase the risk of, uh, of developing MS, although none appears to have a large effect on its own, single effect on its own. Uh, yet significant gains have been realized in the treatment of uh, various forms of MS over the last couple of decades, leading to several classes of therapeutics, which broadly uh, fall into immunomodulators, anti-cell trafficking, and cell-depleting uh, therapies. With more than 18 disease-modifying therapeutics in hand, the DMTs, many of which are mechanistically distinct, no single approach or single uh, agent has produced uh, sustainable relief uh, for patients. Today we tackle and discuss these issues uh, and look into the future with a distinguished panel of academic and uh, uh, industry leaders. And today we have uh, Ralph Kern, the president and chief medical officer at uh, Brainstorm Cell, Dan Lorraine, who's the CSO of uh, Pipeline Therapeutics, Joachim uh, Hertz, who's, who's at the Center for Translational Neurodegeneration Research at UT Southwestern, and, and Krish Ramanathan, the Global Program Head at Novartis. So each of you has had seminal findings, uh, unique approaches, or recently approved products uh, spanning the spectra of R&D space from 
the discovery of targets to the approval of multiple modalities for therapeutic intervention. Uh, I would like to start with Krish and Novartis uh, received approval for drug multiple sclerosis in August 20, uh, 2020. Uh, congratulations, by the way. Uh, it's always great to have a drug approval in the market uh, for, for anyone. But let me ask you, uh, what does the drug mean for patients? What does this drug mean for patients? Thanks for your question, Rich. And uh, thank you for the uh, congratulations as well. It's a big sign of relief uh, to the whole team working on this. So, um, you know, at Novartis, we have a whole bunch of scientists here. And our job is we try to challenge medical paradigms and uh, explore new possibilities intervene in chronic illnesses earlier so that we can change the long-term quality of life. And uh, we've been part of the neuroscience community for more than 75 years now. So coming back to multiple sclerosis, you know, despite many treatment options in the current treatment landscape, uh, there is still significant patient dissatisfaction. Um, there remains a, a need, an unmet need for early treatment with high efficacy therapies that can change the long-term course and, and not a stepwise approach to uh, escalated into higher efficacies once patients begin progression. You know, MS is a disease that's often triggered by an acute inflammatory attack. And we hope that with the drug, we're able to sort of shut down this focal inflammation um, that happens. It's a disease that starts off with the B cell activation leading to T cell activation and eventual neurodegeneration. But if we can stop the B cells from activating the T cells, that's the hope of the drug. So on the MRI data, patients who went in uh, with multiple lesions, came out of the study with no lesions. So uh, a 98 plus percent reduction in lesion burden. So we hope that this brings a significant benefit. In the second year of treatment, if you look at it, patients who persisted with the treatment, nine out of 10 treatments remained uh, free of disease. And, and there's a term we use called NADA, or no F evidence of disease activity. And you use uh, either inflammation by MRI or relapses or progression. And so nearly nine out of 10 patients Remain free. So this brings hope, right? So, and the, finally, this is a drug that can be self administered by patients. And that is a key criteria, especially in a pandemic. Uh, you don't want to spend hours uh, sitting in an infusion center uh, getting access to high efficacy therapies. So, we believe that these um, attributes um, bring a lot of patient value in uh, ensuring an early treatment with the high efficacy therapy that makes us a sort of a first choice treatment in patients with the relapsing MS. So we have a portfolio of medicines. Each patient's MS journey is different, and so we hope that this gives a choice. But I, I fully attest to what you said in the beginning. There is still an unmet need in stopping the neurodegenerative aspects of multiple sclerosis. What's the over, uh, overarching strategy for Novartis in this space? We, we hope that we, by earlier treatment options, we can stop the progression. So if you can identify uh, those inflammatory triggers from the very beginning, because that's the portfolio of medicines we have, we have medicines that can really interrupt the neuroinflammation process. So if you can identify either through biomarkers or through clinical history, identify patients very early in the disease, and if you can bring down the focal inflammation, it can lead to a significant amount of uh, um, you know, pr preservation of quality of life and reduce further damage that can come through neurodegeneration. We continue research activities in the neurodegeneration. We don't have a silver bullet yet, but we continue to do that. That may make complementary medicines to what we already have. Thank you. Ralph, can you describe your platform, your technology platform? And, uh, and at what stage do you think the therapy would be uh, best, best implemented? Uh, early stage, late stage? Yeah, Richard, thanks for, the, thanks for the intro and the kind words. Uh, we're taking a complementary approach to the approach that Krishnan has just described. And I was very proud of all of Novartis's accomplishments. I think they're, they're really transformative for people with MS. I think the challenge really is that there still is a biological unmet need and there's a human unmet need, a patient unmet need. And well, uh, really in terms of uh, the neurodegenerative process, which begins immediately, it would be nice if it, if it never happened, but I think that's the pipe dream. So I think the approach that we're taking is that ongoing compartmentalized inflammation in the brain and neurodegeneration, uh, as well as loss of trophic support, in other words, the neurotrophic factor support, are all processes that are, that are in play literally from the, from the first day of all these diseases. 
Uh, and what we're trying to do is use a cell delivered therapy. We're trying to deliver, deliver biologically relevant molecules that can address each of these three pathways by uh, using a, a people's own cells as a technology platform, uh, creating a very pure fraction of these cells, uh, taking the cells one step further uh, to produce five to 10 times the amount of these repair molecules, and then delivering the cells directly back into the spinal fluid where they're free to travel and, and go to areas of damage and continually release their products. So, Unlike most biologics that are made in large bioreactors, we use nanoscale bioreactors. We deliver 100 million cells. The cells continue to produce their products, and these products impact those pathways. And the advances in medicine that have allowed this are one, you know, the manufacturing advances, advances in terms of cell therapies. I think there's been essentially a paradigm shift in the last few years in terms of how well and efficiently the cells can be, can be made. Um, secondly, um, the biomarker universe, all the way from in vitro through in vivo animal models and through to human biomarker experiments are, are essential, not, not, not important. They're essential to know exactly what cargo is being delivered, whether that cargo is being uh, measurably uh, increased in patients and then whether that cargo delivery impacts pharmacodynamically the traditional uh, disease pathways. It's different than a traditional molecule because you know you can measure PKPD. Uh, all of my, my co-panelists are doing that quite uh, assiduously. It's very difficult with cell therapies to do that. And you know, in the CAR T space, they don't they can't measure how many CAR T cells are there, but they can measure the impact that the CAR Ts have on disease biomarkers. We do a similar approach where we measure things like neurofilament, measure things like inflammatory biomarkers, measures of cell death, and we can show that we can move them in the right direction and then try to correlate that with, uh, with the disease uh, pathways that we know are important. So in terms of when, does this, uh, when is this approach uh, uh, ready for, for play, there's certain diseases like ALS where from day one people need it. Because there are no uh, there are no there are no treatments right now that can impact a disease that has a 30 month average survival. For diseases like progressive MS, what we've done is we've selected uh, patients who have uh, who have entered the progressive phase, who have stable disease activity, and have a residual deficit that can't be addressed by existing therapies, and and that's the area that we're we're looking at. In Alzheimer's disease, we've moved slightly differently where we're using biomarker selected patients who have specific disease biomarkers as inclusion criteria. And we think that this approach of uh, uh, for each disease, and I think for MS, there's a very, there is a window of opportunity to intervene. And uh, that's the approach that we're taking. And everything we do involves biomarkers. I think that's the way of the future, um, not just because we need it to confirm the cells uh, activity and their cargo delivery, but because we think that that will help us understand the clinical outcomes better. Um, we think the regulatory world is moving in that direction as well. So I hope, hope I've answered your, uh, your question. Oh, terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, Dan, uh, first, uh, congratulations on, on your uh, uh, financing last year for a Series B financing late, late uh, December, I guess it was, in 2019. So my question to you is, how will this round be used to support the development of Pipeline Therapeutics Emerging MS Portfolio? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, and as you well know, uh, money goes fast. We're actually already knee deep into our next raise. Um, but uh, I guess you could say we're working on a, a more traditional approach. Uh, we're leveraging our chemistry expertise uh, to design uh, brain penetrant small molecule therapeutics uh, to target remyelination. And, you know, I, I can say we all know and appreciate that uh, MS is a chronic uh, lifelong disease. And to date, as has been mentioned, there are several disease modifying immune uh, therapies that have been developed to treat MS. And they've had good success in controlling certain aspects of the disease. But unfortunately, as has been pointed out, at least currently, it appears patients, uh, even those on the most potent immune modulators, still tend to progress. And that's a key issue. And uh, we also know that disease progression or disability is inversely related to brain volume and brain volume loss is a result of axonal loss, uh, in other words, neurodegeneration. 
and this occurs following demyelination. So our goal here is to identify small molecule remyelination therapeutics uh, with the goal of protecting axons, restoring function, and preventing disease progression. So um, yeah, our lead program uh, is an M1 receptor antagonist. Uh, this is based on findings that came out of UCSF from our academic collaborators, Jonah Chan, Ari Green. I, I guess you could say this is a, a pure OPC differentiation play. So M1 is expressed in OPCs, uh, blocking the receptor we know uh, facilitates OPC differentiation into mature myelin-producing oligodendrocytes. And uh, we are in late uh, preclinical development. We have a molecule that we call PIPE 307, and we're uh, hopeful to begin early clinical development of this molecule late this year and into early next year. Uh, behind M1, we have a, 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 a heavy med chemistry effort right now on our second program, which is an LPA1 receptor antagonist. Uh, this receptor is also expressed on OPCs, and, and in addition to OPCs, it's actually expressed on mature oligodendrocytes as well. Uh, we know that blocking this receptor can um, also facilitate OPC differentiation and myelination, but there's a, a much broader play uh, here uh, in that uh, we also know that LPA, uh, the lipid ligand for the LPA1 receptor, is neuroinflammatory. So we believe that by blocking uh, the LPA1 receptor, not only will we facilitate uh, differentiation and remyelination, but we'll also be able to tamp down some of the neuroinflammation uh, response that occurs in MS. And then behind that, uh, we have a much earlier program with an undisclosed target uh, for axonal protection. And so, yeah, our goal with the financing is to move all of these uh, programs, each uh, small molecule programs, uh, into clinical development. Thanks. So these uh, targets are all mechanistically distinct, uh, the programs that you're working on. And Correct. it must be reflective of the, the complexity of disease, right? So then what, uh, a couple of questions follow up from that. What are the implications uh, for at what stage of MS might they be used? And what have you learned so far from your preclinical studies or even uh, work that's been done in the clinical space with, uh, with, with, with those mechanisms? Uh, our belief is that actually for all of these targets, uh, we want early uh, intervention. And uh, really the next uh, big thing for us is to figure out um, how we can combine some of these different uh, targets, because we do think that they are, they are complementary and, um, and we need smart ways of combining those. We're working those out in our animal models now. And we also need to uh, learn how to combine these properly with an immune modulator. Great, thank you. And so, so jo Joachim, you had this very uh, uh, interesting science translational medicine publication describing the role of the protein relin in multiple sclerosis. Uh, uh, you're invoking uh, potential use as a biomarker of disease and then also as a therapeutic target for therapeutic intervention. Uh, so what's the evidence you gathered on the significance of relin with respect uh, to either uh, uh, clinical correlates and also uh, from your preclinical studies? Yeah, so uh, thank you first, uh, Richard, for inviting me to serve here in this panel. And uh, I'm really humbled to serve with uh, uh, that many uh, of our co my colleagues here who know a lot more about this disease probably than I do. Uh, but um, uh, what uh, we came into this from the left field, uh, studying real and for over 20 years as a, a protein which is required for formation of the brain and for regulating uh, synaptic homeostasis. And uh, after we uh, amassed uh, uh, tools, various tools uh, studying uh, the function of this protein in the brain, uh, we uh, realized that uh, it's not only made in the brain, but actually it's also made in the liver. So we were able to uh, now test uh, what it was doing in the periphery. This was initially a really a side project, which we didn't really think was, uh, would be leading uh, uh, to such an uh, a novel uh, finding as the one which you just mentioned uh, earlier, a role of this uh, protein potentially as a therapy in, um, uh, in MS. Uh, so what uh, we did when we knocked out this protein uh, in the, the periphery in the liver and uh, tested its effect on, uh, vascular, uh, on the vasculature, uh, what we found uh, in a model of uh, vascular lesion development was that uh, relin uh, deficiency, so intervening with uh, relin expression, the plasma and neutralizing it, uh, actually protected the vascular wall uh, from uh, lesion formation, specifically atherosclerosis. And when we followed uh, the molecular mechanisms behind uh, this protection, what we found was that uh, uh, relin regulates the expression of endothelial adhesion molecules 
which uh, 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 transiently trap circulating immune cells, attach them to the endothelial surface, and uh, thereby induce them to listen for inflammatory signals from the subendothelial space, uh, not only uh, in the peripheral lesions, uh, any elsewhere in the body, but also actually in the brain. And uh, uh, by uh, cutting uh, 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 relin, uh, this relin signal off, uh, there are fewer immune cells listening to these inflammatory signals and therefore fewer uh, uh, chances for them to extravasate, leaving the vascular bed and uh, contributing to the inflammation in the uh, organ behind it. Uh, so we realized that this uh, uh, general, very general principle would be applicable to a very wide range of uh, inflammatory diseases, among them uh, uh, MS, and uh, since there are readily available animal models um, for multiple sclerosis called experimental autoimmune encephalitis, uh, we could very quickly test this uh, concept in mice, and that led us to uh, this uh, really very gratifying finding that intervening uh, with uh, circulating a relin in uh, the plasma, which we can easily do by developing monoclonal, using monoclonal antibodies, which uh, neutralize it, suck it basically out of the circulation, uh, uh, that this uh, uh, significantly curtailed um, uh, the uh, inflammatory process in the animal models. Now, um, you mentioned biomarkers, and the next step obviously was to see, well, this would also apply uh, to humans. So uh, in um, anonymized human plasma samples from control patients, uh, MS patients uh, with uh, 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 in the relapse uh, with an active disease, as well as MS patients uh, um, um, uh, uh, in the remission, um, what we uh, uh, then found was that relin levels did uh, uh, appear to correlate uh, with um, the disease status. So relin levels in plasma are higher in patients who actually suffer a relapse and they go down again when the patient is in remission. And that made uh, perfect sense for us because uh, uh, relin seems to be triggered, the expression of relin seems to be triggered by inflammatory processes which are going on in the body. So if you're having an inflammatory process somewhere, Okay. That inf those inflammatory signals seem to upregulate the expression of relin, which is made um, mainly in the liver, actually peripherally, and uh, circulates through the bloodstream and thereby prepares the vascular bed for uh, uh, the um, uh, eventuality that this uh, inflammation might spread somewhere else uh, by positioning immune cells at the site where they can very quickly then uh, react. Uh, so uh, uh, increasing uh, levels of relin in the plasma of a patient should be a sign of ongoing inflammation and uh, probably an, uh, a sign that one should now intervene, uh, uh, cutting uh, the inflammatory process. And one way of doing this is by um, using antibodies to suck out relin from the circulation, thereby dampening the immune system, reducing this exaggerated response, and uh, thus uh, uh, curtailing uh, the inflammatory process, which is so destructive on the brain. So are you pursuing uh, the therapeutic approach uh, as an opportunity? Yes, this is, uh, this is fantastic. As I said, uh, 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 this uh, um, uh, discovery came out, and this new concept, actually, what Relin is doing, which we had no idea before we actually followed this seemingly uh, wild lead. Uh, uh, they are, why would we be interested in the protein that's made in the brain, uh, uh, but also secreted by the liver? Uh, uh, and uh, when we found uh, that this is such a general principle, which is being regulated by Relin, uh, with uh, broad clinical application, this uh, immediately told us that we had here an opportunity uh, to uh, move a discovery out of uh, the fundamental uh, uh, research uh, arena and uh, develop it uh, towards uh, the clinic. So uh, this is something which um, I had never done before and which I was very much uh, looking forward to doing. So the way uh, uh, to do this, uh, of course, is, is you have to move it out of an academic lab and uh, uh, do this in a dedicated um, biotechnology uh, enterprise. So we founded this uh, a new small company, which is really a fledgling company with a goal of uh, developing uh, anti relin antibodies, which we can eventually uh, uh, put into the clinic. So this is now uh, moved out of the uh, discovery 
uh, uh, space uh, into what I usually like to refer to as the engineering phase. And uh, anybody who likes to tinker uh, uh, actually will be very excited in uh, having such an opportunity in their life to follow. So I'm looking very much forward to this. Thank you very much. This is, you know, it's impressive to see such a wide range of modalities being developed uh, as potential therapies for, uh, for MS. And we have, uh, you know, uh, cell therapies, there's antibodies, there's uh, small molecules. So let me start off with the small molecule team uh, with uh, Dan. Dan, and then I'd like to move to, uh, to Krish. Uh, well, maybe we talk uh, uh, about would different modalities be used at different times? So uh, Dan. Yeah, uh, so good question. Um, you know, at this stage, there have been uh, multiple targets identified, um, strictly speaking from a remyelination perspective. And, uh, you know, there's very good validation in animal models for a lot of these targets. Uh, but it's, it's actually, no, it's not clear which one is, is going to work the best in patients. Um, we're biased. Of course, we like our targets. Uh, uh, from our perspective, uh, we do have early indications of efficacy uh, with a related molecule, clomastine. It's not an M1 selective antagonist, but it was a pan antagonist, and it did show some efficacy on uh, improving remyelination in MS patients. But um, yeah, no, I guess uh, multiple approaches, multiple targets, and ultimately these are going to have to be worked out uh, in a clinical setting. Hey, uh, Chris, you, uh, Novartis has uh, taken on a number of therapy uh, modalities in many different areas. Uh, how about in, in, in MS? Yeah, I, I think um, it really depends on what is the target and what we want to achieve by it. I think we've, uh, early on, we worked on small molecules, like uh, both the Jelenia and Mazent are small molecules that um, stop the egress of T cells from, uh, from the lymph and, uh, and, and attacks into the brain. I think if you want to enter the CNS compartment, small molecules are the best way to do it. So you can permit the entry as long as they're not kicked out of the CNS. Um, but if you want to act on the periphery, if you want to stop the immune cells from coming into the CNS and attacking, then the CD20 uh, antibodies provide uh, a nice way to do it, to interrupt the signaling so that at a more upstream level so that you can stop all of those uh, potential uh, entry from the periphery. And, uh, and also it gives a good kinetic profile because you know the B cell production takes some time, but with our therapy, which is a antibody that can be given as a monthly self-administration, you interrupt the cycle of production so you can keep those circulating B cells at bay and not coming from recurrence. And this stops the signaling cascade. If we were to look for neuro, neurodegeneration targets, I think small molecules make a good way to go in because once the blood-brain barrier is closed, then it is difficult for these large molecules to otherwise enter and either start the remyelination or stop the neurodegeneration process. So those are very good for small molecules, potentially even gene therapies, if you can find a way to have a constituent expression in the CNS. So it, it really depends. Um, we hope that potentially in the future, there might be combination therapies, you know, in other disease areas, like in rheumatology, uh, people are comfortable doing combination therapy, but in uh, multiple sclerosis and in neurology in particular, these are challenging based on, because you add the toxicities eventually. And even with just stopping these, uh, um, it, you know, entry of inflammatory molecules into the CNS can sort of activate or permit the growth of brain resident viruses, like what we've seen in the past. So safety is paramount. We need to make sure that we can conquer that and still um, you know, interrupt the process of neuro neurodegeneration that can help progressive MS patients. Oh, for you, would you like to comment on, on this? Yeah, absolutely. I have a few things, a few comments to make. I mean, the, first of all, I appreciate Krishnan's comments. Um, I think early in the, you know, it depends on what the objectives are. I think that's really and also uh, the objectives change during the course of disease. So early on, there are certain objectives. Later on, there are others. Um, early on in MS, there seems to be a lot of peripheral immune activation. And I think that that's where the targets are. And, and I'm, hoping, I'm hoping, and patients I'm sure are hoping that very early intervention with very effective treatments will, will nip it in the bud. Um, the approach that we're taking is that uh, later in the course of MS, there's compartmentalized inflammation, and it's less dependent on the blood-brain barrier and any other factors. It just takes up, you know, the immune immune cells take up residence, and almost like uh, almost like local inflammation and other diseases have their own almost in, inflammatory organ that's that's 
operating. And what, we, what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to deliver the therapies directly into the central nervous system using the, the CSF pathways that are very well understood for other, and they're used in other diseases as well. So um, again, and even within a group of patients, there are uh, different objectives. So for example, addressing compartmentalized inflammation is one objective. Addressing the, uh, you know, the dysfunctional uh, neuronal structures, loss of axons and synaptic loss is another objective. Uh, and then stabilizing the whole support system in the brain, this loss of trophic support is another objective. And essentially we're, we're providing, you know, multiple shots on goal. And it's impossible to know uh, in any one patient, which of these pathways is more important because absent biomarkers that suggest which pathway is overactive in a given patient, you don't know if, if someone with MS might have predominantly a, de a degenerative process or predominantly an inf a compartmentalized inflammatory process. I think biomarkers will help tease that apart into patients subgroups, which will allow more targeted therapies. And then finally, the last thing I wanna say is that we are doing uh, combination therapies in MS. So for example, we allow uh, disease modifying therapies. We have, uh, we've, done, we've, looked, we've done some very important interactive studies anticipating the high success of CD20 therapies. And we've ensured that the uh, cells that we manufacture don't express CD20 on the surface. And they don't have, uh, they don't have uh, gene expression of, of message for CD20 either. So I think that those are gonna be the important uh, preclinical studies that allow for rational combinations. First of all, look, making sure that the treatments aren't opposing each other. And then I, I agree with Christian that the next step is safety and that, you know, Combining therapies might, uh, might, might augment safety issues. And I think it's very important mm -hmm. to do that. In our MS study, we're doing very careful monitoring of quantitative MRI to make sure that we don't have, new le we don't have extra lesions. We, don't, we want fewer lesions, not more. And we're being very careful. That's just obviously something we're tracking very carefully. And then the, finally, the last thing is, um, even though there's biological processes that need to be targeted, one has to determine what's clinically meaningful for patients. In other words, what's the outcome that's valuable that will be meaningful to the patients and society? And you know, if it's improved function, then I think one needs to be very deliberate and precise about how one measures that. And that's one of the approaches that we're taking is trying to determine, you know, what are those objectives for functional improvement? In other words, what percentage improvement in walking speed or other levels of recognized MS function need to be targeted. And I think one needs to do all of those things well in order to advance the field. And I'm, I'm sure my colleagues are uh, thinking about all the same issues that I am. Yeah, would anyone else like to comment on that? I guess maybe just one comment. Um, safety has come up a few times and that actually is a key issue because uh, with a lot of these therapies, uh, they're going to be delivered uh, for a lifetime, uh, very likely. And so uh, that sort of raises the bar from a safety perspective and so whatever targets are identified or, or um, drugs developed toward those targets uh, need to be safe with low side effect profiles uh, so that um, they don't interfere with the patient's daily lives. Okay. And maybe yeah. one more point to add. I totally agree that safety is paramount here. Also what um, Ralph mentioned on bio, you know, biomarkers or biosignatures, mm -hmm. maybe multiple biomarkers that can sort of give you a peek into what is the phase of multiple sclerosis that the patient may be going through? Um, is, it, is it the inflammatory phase? Is it more progressive? And even within those, are there different flavors? Uh, we have a window into the brain through MRIs that gives you sort of snapshots and pictures, but um, they're not done on a quarterly basis. They're not done every time the patient's visiting the doctor. They're done every time there's a suspicion or a progression that is happening. So if there is something that we can query in the interim period, that understands, uh, is there a neuronal loss, neurofilaments? I know there's tens and sometimes a hundred presentations at these new conferences. Uh, I think we're also excited that this may give another peak or multiple peaks into the journey of the patient. because so this is a protein that is uh, integral to the cytoskeleton of neurons. And uh, based on normal you know, modeling of this protein, you see low levels in blood. And if you see a spike up and there is certainly an injury in these neurons and uh, it must come from either an inflammation or a process that needs to be then considered to see how we can treat that. And it may give a window, it may precipitate an MRI. So 
these are things that I think certainly we can look forward to that may help the patients uh, take charge of the journey. Well, what do you say is our best model in the case of MS for testing our agents before we go into human? Is there a particular model uh, that it best reflects the disease? So, I mean, we've been using uh, the uh, established experimental autoimmune encephalitis model, which is uh, caused by uh, immunization with uh, uh, an uh, antigen which the body has, uh, itself uh, uh, has. Uh, but um, uh, uh, clearly the uh, etiology and also uh, the uh, immune targets uh, in MS uh, are broader uh, than that. Uh, but the nature of uh, the intervention generally preventing uh, the accumulation of excessive more immune cells, recruitment of more immune cells from the circulation into the brain, where it then uh, uh, tends to uh, uh, exacerbate the local uh, inflammation caused by uh, microglia should be uh, applicable to actually any of the etiologies uh, uh, in MS. And I'd really uh, uh, like to hear what my other colleagues have to say to that as well. So we use the um, MOG EAE model um, in our preclinical experiments and basically delivered um, either um, no treatment, uh, the undifferentiated MSC cells or the differentiated product that produces higher repair molecules. And we compared it, the intrathecal administration of the two, of, of all, th all three, uh, either, either sham, uh, uh, undifferentiated or differentiated cells. And we saw, you know, motor improvements and survival differences, the usual outcomes. I, I think the challenge with these experiments is that, you know, we're, that's, I think they're, the EAE model may be more useful for relapsing MS. I, I, don't, I don't believe that there's a good model for progressive MS. I think these are necessary steps that everybody takes, but I don't think there's a good enough model yet for progressive MS. And may, maybe my colleagues know of one, but I, I'm not aware of a good model yet. Maybe I could just comment. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we also use the MOG EAE uh, model, but we use a, a unique tool um, uh, from a clinical translation perspective, and it's uh, visual evoked potential. So we know VEP is used clinically in MS patients. We know when there's demyelination of the anterior visual pathway, VEP latencies uh, increase, and that's because of the conduction velocity uh, issues with demyelination. But what's interesting, Ari Green, our collaborator, um, went back to the bench uh, to figure out if you can use the VEP technique in an animal model. And uh, yes, he was able to show that in the MOG EA mouse model, there's demyelination of the anterior visual pathway that leads to a VEP uh, latency delay. And with treatment, you can show an improvement in VEP and you can correlate that to an improvement in uh, myelin and in remyelination in particular. Hey, is that is yeah. that uh, used in the or can it be used in the clinical senses of monitoring of disease progression, uh, coming in early, for example? Uh, well, it is used clinically. Um, it's it's been it's been used in a in a few studies in MS patients who have chronic opti optic neuropathy or acute uh, optic neuritis. Okay, thank you. I think that maybe well, well, to add to it, I think one of the challenges would be what. Where is the location of the lesions? You know, if they have, as you said, rightly said, if they have chronic optic neuritis and there is a impact on visual evoked potentials, then it might give you uh, an idea of the progression in these patients. Often the disease of MS itself is complex based on the location of these lesions. Yeah. That also makes it challenging to draw out, you know, meaningful conclusions from small animal models to then say, what is the impact on clinical symptoms that you can have? Uh, doing the EAE model, which is I'm not an expert in preclinical science, but I've heard that that is the model that we use in Novartis as well to screen some of these compounds. It's good from a broad brush description of the disease, but to look at, you know, minute symptoms of progression um, instead of just broad disability and just dysfunction, uh, we need to really understand uh, at a more complex level. And it, we have to do the human studies to understand how this can help with patient symptoms. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ralph. We had a discussion uh, around targeted delivery. Uh, so yeah. what, do you, what do you see as, in particular, e e exosomes? Would you like to comment on that, please? Yeah, so uh, the cell um, mechanism of action that we're relying on is essentially a paracrine mechanism where the cells are releasing biologically active molecules and in the vicinity of other cells. And these, act, these, these molecules interact with receptors that are well known. Um, 
the uh, release, the actual release of the biologically active molecules can occur through exosomal mechanisms or non-exosomal mechanisms. And what we've done is um, we've compared uh, in preclinical experiments the amount of uh, repair molecules that are released through each of these mechanisms. And we, sh we show that they're roughly comparable and also the immunomodulation of cells versus exosomes is roughly comparable on a pound per pound basis. In other words, we have, let's say three to 8,000 exosomes produced per cell and we can, we can compare the, the effects. So uh, there are advantages of exosomal treatments. One is that they're easier, it's easier to formulate uh, the stability. It doesn't involve all the other cellular machinery. If you want a pure targeted delivery uh, mechanism, exosomes really do have, do have some advantages. Um, the other thing is that you can modify the cargo of exosomes. You can load, uh, you can induce the cargo differently in exosomes, and you can also target the surface. And finally, um, you know, in our hands and others, uh, we've shown that the exosomes are very avidly taken up by the target tissues so that we can, we can label the exosomes with various tracking molecules, and we can show that they're taken up into the target tissues, either in culture or in animals and they can produce biologically relevant effects. So I think that's the next iteration of what we're doing right now. Uh, we've done some interesting experiments in um, different neurodegenerative diseases, in eye diseases, retinal disease, and also uh, most recently we, uh, we actually did some interesting experiments in ARDS because of all the interest in COVID. We we're able to show that the exosomes, uh, particularly from the differentiated cells, had profound effects on the target tissues, both in terms of uh, decreasing tissue injury and also reducing inflammation, either cell infiltration or cytokines. So it's, it's obviously um, a very active area of research for many companies. Um, and it, down the road, it may be possible that one of the molecules that one of my colleagues is working on could be packaged in an exosome and delivered uh, in some way, shape or form. Um, and finally, the last thing I'm gonna say is that I still believe that uh, local administration is, is the way to go right now until such a time as the blood-brain barrier is sorted out, except for small molecules, which is a different kettle of fish. Very hard to deliver large molecules uh, systemically. I think it's, it's, it's really not, not practical. So what kind of technologies are we missing to uh, advance some of these uh, therapies into the clinic? I mean, the, we have technology gaps, clearly. Uh, we have to fill. Uh, thoughts on where to, what kind of key technologies uh, you'd like to see or we need? Uh, well, to move I, I, think, I think there are good technologies. Um, we, we, we're not using them as well as we can. I think we're, um, I think there are many studies that don't use enough biomarker assessments. I think that's, that's a huge, um, uh, we look, you know, we looked at um, clinical trial enrichment and different, different diseases and such a small percentage use sophisticated methods. I think that that's, that's a miss, missed opportunity. Uh, and then finally, um, I think, you know, there's a couple of approaches that might be useful. One is to combine clinical and biomarker characteristics as either inclusion criteria, or at least to stratify the results afterwards to have pre-planned stratification based on certain biomarker categories. Um, one has to start somewhere. I think if, obviously if you knew the answer, you would just do it, but I think that uh, there's huge opportunities in many of, many of the studies that my colleagues are doing to, to have um, strat, you know, uh, pre-specified stratification based on certain categories. And I think that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I could just comment, um, bringing it back to remyelination. You can see where I'm focused. Um, yeah, so a key issue with remyelination uh, therapeutics is imaging myelin uh, and being able to detect remyelination in the human brain. Uh, it's easy to do in a mouse, right? You can do that histologically, uh, not easy to do in human. Uh, the MRI techniques are getting better, but um, I think we need to develop uh, myelin imaging tools. Um, and so there's some nice work coming out of Case Western. Uh, we have some of our own work uh, in-house that we're developing, but I think that's a key issue. That's one key issue is being able to detect myelin, demyelination and remyelination. Okay, uh, anybody else? Yeah, maybe, well, maybe just two points. One, I think certainly key gaps or key areas of improvement in technology for uh, biomarker assessment. One is in imaging. 
as, uh, as Dan, you mentioned, coming up with maybe more uh, cost-effective imaging solutions mm -hmm. that can give us either more frequent, uh, you know, looks into the brain and also maybe on precision imaging on what's going on either in myelination or um, other areas at a more microscopic level. And the other is blood-borne biomarkers. I think we have made a lot of steps because we are looking at a big dilution effect of anything that is in the CNS that comes to, that's visible in serum. You're looking at picogram levels. You need to be, have, uh, you need to have very sensitive detection of these molecules of uh, whether they're acute phase or markers of progression. I uh, think we've made some steps. I think we can detect some of these in serum today because we don't want to do intrathecal measurements of these uh, uh, biomarkers or CNS uh, samples. So there are still steps, but I think um, how quickly they get used and incorporated into clinical practice, there's a few, few years off still. Mm. What do you see as new directions in the area of multiple sclerosis? Uh, one topic that had come up in our discussion previously was that of antigen-specific therapies. Uh, anyone would like to comment on that, for example, or other aspects of new directions uh, going on in MS? Well, one thing that comes to mind is uh, absolutely, can you prevent the disease? And uh, do we know enough about the disease to stop it from occurring? I mean, today we, uh, the guidelines keep changing. We can detect it earlier and earlier from uh, what constitutes multiple sclerosis. Is it a single relapse? You can look into the brain, you can look at blood markers and diagnose it earlier, but can you prevent it? Can you see who might develop multiple sclerosis and can you develop uh, immunomodulator or you know, antigen specific tolerization that might help uh, prevent the first attack, that first B cells from turning pathogenic? Uh, it's still our immune system is, is a thing of beauty. You know, it doesn't break down all that often, but when it does break down, it goes into an irreversible mode. And uh, you know, we don't want the, the breakdown of uh, tolerance inside the body it would be great if we can find a way to tolerate patients to those. We're still far away, but uh, this would be a big window into the future, into the next complete new generation of therapies or preventions. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can add um, another area that I think would be you know, transformational would be to predict who's going to develop the neurodegenerative part of MS. Mm -hmm. It may be genetic tests, maybe other biomarkers, because look, there's a lot of people that have a lot of relapsing disease, but don't for somehow that some reason they have a resistance to entering that degenerative phase. And there's other, other patients who begin the degenerative phase right from day one. And there must be biological differences that explain that. Um, and if one knew that a patient was at high risk of entering a degenerative phase, two things might happen. One is that a more aggressive uh, treatment for relapsing remitting disease might be started early because even a small number of, uh, a small amount of disease activity could push that person over the edge, or there may be an introduction of treatment specifically targeting the degenerative uh, component earlier, earlier on. And I think that type of precision medicine would be a huge advance, uh, obviously require a lot of scientific progress, but I think that would make a big difference. Okay. Uh, we're just about out of time. What I'd like to do now is to just get some uh, closing thoughts uh, around the next generation of, of, of MS therapy. What are your views on what that next generation should look like? Uh, may I start with Ralph in this case? Well, first of all, I, I hope all my colleagues are successful and they, they put us out of business. But, um, I, you know, I, I still think there's going to be unmet needs because of the genetic heterogeneity in, in any human disease. One of the problems with the animal models is they're all genetically identical. And all the humans are genetically different. And I think that um, until we can crack the code, uh, we're gonna have to come up with um, uh, much more targeted therapies, addressing different populations of patients, different stages of the disease, and also different components of the disease, looking at the peripheral versus central inflammation, looking at inflammation versus degeneration, and looking at the inadequate remyelination. So I think that that's a direction everybody needs to go in. And I'm hoping that uh, targeted projects and programs that look at each of these parts will then be successful. And hopefully combinations of these will eventually be, be used. Uh, uh, Joachim, uh, why don't I uh, talk, uh, ask you to comment on, uh, have some closing uh, thoughts. 
so yeah, first of all, I'd, I'd like to echo that. And second of all, I'd say that uh, our paper was published only uh, about uh, three weeks ago, two weeks ago. And uh, uh, so we think that is actually the next generation, which we are going to explore for the moment and then see where that leads us. And uh, we have very high hopes that this is uh, going to be a very useful approach to support uh, the existing uh, uh, therapies uh, in combination um, uh, with uh, what has already proven to be uh, uh, fairly successful uh, in MS. And hopefully uh, we can uh, uh, contribute to, um, uh, with a new uh, approach to lower the inflammatory threshold so much that the body actually has a chance to heal itself. And uh, uh, that may be uh, one of my biggest hopes uh, uh, that we can achieve. Uh, Dan? Um, yeah, no, I'm uh, just excited for all the different approaches that are going on um, and my fellow panelists and, and, and everything that you're doing. Um, I guess my perspective is that from a near-term perspective, um, I, I think what we're looking at is uh, combining something like a remyelination therapeutic with an immune modulator. And again, um, I seem biased, but uh, one of the main reasons is that uh, there's an, a, a crop of these remyelination therapeutics that are finally making their way into clinical development. And so I think we can properly test them at this stage. And yeah, wonderful. And Krish? Yeah, perfectly. I think complete agreement with all the panelists here. We have, uh, I think there's quite a bit of new therapies to look forward to. With the um, availability of uh, multiple disease modifying therapies, we're able to tackle the inflammatory phase and give them a good course of the near-term disease. And I think with the le level of biomarkers and other things that we can measure, also give a promise that they may have a, a better course in the future, um, maybe with new combination therapies and potentially even if we are successful with the neurodegenerative medicines that we have to stop the progression. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dan and, and Krish and, and Joachim and uh, Ralph for your participation uh, on, on this drug uh, development uh, uh, panel. And on behalf of the Wuji Aptech organization, we wish to thank all of our speakers for your insights and thoughtful discussion on multiple sclerosis. Our webinar series on collaborations that transform examines diseases with much unmet needs with a focus on science and innovation, awareness and education, with the goals to deliver, ultimately deliver, meaningful therapies to patients. We also wish to thank those who viewed today's webinar and hope you found the discussion to be useful, meaningful, and valuable. We look forward to seeing you again at a future Collaborations That Transform webinar. Thank you. <laughs>